So welcome uh, to this um, intimate gathering, this book talk with Jonathan Ray. Um, we are very, very happy to have him here tonight as part of the spring semester 2020 programming of the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking, picked. That's us over there. Who are we? What do we do? Uh, the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking is a non-profit educational association registered under the Loi des Associations 1901 here in Paris in France. We are focused on the humanities and the arts. We provide educational programming in the humanities and the arts. All of our programming is in the English language. And uh, uh, apart from our own sort of initiatives in order to create our programming. We also work together with a number of partner institutions throughout uh, Paris and sort of like the greater Paris area. So for instance, the Red Bill Barrel Bookstore tonight, where we are is a gracious host for many of our more intimate events. But we also have uh, partners around the, around the city with, which, with whom we work together on other formats of events. So for example, Tomorrow night, uh, uh, Jonathan Ray is going to give a talk on Wittgenstein and the history of philosophy, and that's going to happen in partnership with the Fondation Maison des Sciences de l'Homme, which is the FMSH, which is on Boulevard Raspail. So we're going to be there. We're going to we're going to be using their venue tomorrow night. Um, normally, when we do an event, we try to partner it with a. Uh, with uh, an institution that also has an interest in the theme of the event. So at the, at the beginning of uh, last year, uh, we, did a, we did an event on Friedrich Nietzsche, and we did that at the Goethe Institute. So that was uh, something themed. We did uh, a whole course on Søren Kierkegaard at the, at the Fondation Danoise. So we tried to find partners who have common interests for the specific topics that we're, that we're uh, uh, talking about in our events. <coughs> Why do we exist? What do we try to do? Well, firstly, our goal is to carry critical thinking and the humanities from the universities onto the street to the, to the larger public. We do feel that these days uh, uh, the format towards which universities are moving uh, makes it more difficult to engage in critical thinking and also it leaves less space for the humanities which we regard as a natural home of critical thinking. So we're trying to say, well, okay, if this is not really happening at universities anymore and we're all young scholars, how can we make this content, how can we make this content meet uh, the people. So we try. We try to take. We try to bring together a diverse group of people for these kinds of events, as as here right now. So that is our main goal: is to bring humanities and critical thinking from uh, this from the universities to the street. But also, we regard ourselves more specifically as a kind of bridge between the intellectual and cultural life of France, as expressed in the city of Paris, and a broad and the broader intellectual and cultural world at large. Because we feel that often a lot of things don't necessarily translate. I mean, you know, a lot of stuff here is produced in French, and uh, international audiences don't have so much access to it. But also, we want to bring the best of the international cultural and intellectual production to France, and English being the lingua franca in general of, academic, of the academic world these days, we use English in order to accomplish that. What do we do in specific? Because we're a nonprofit, we have a large number of free public events, like book talks like tonight, or Jonathan Ray's lecture that he's going to give tomorrow. Those are all free and public to open to the public. We, we also organize conferences together with universities from around the world, uh, which are all free, and everybody can come to them. We have another strand of programming, which is applied workshops. For instance, so far we've done uh, creative writing workshops uh, that, that we organize once a semester regularly. We've done chess workshops, so, so workshops with a bit more of an applied uh, angle to them. And finally, uh, the backbone, the main uh, 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 sort of component of our programming is our 18-hour courses, which are designed to be as long as a regular university, one semester university course here in France. But they will, be folk they will be in the English language, and they will be focused on philosophy, on the arts, on cultural studies. There will be specific topics. Those have enrollment fees. But the, uh, since we're a nonprofit, the reason we charge enrollment fees is that we want our uh, course designers and instructors to get fair compensation for their courses, uh, possibly, hopefully, fairer than they would get at a university as an adjunct. So most, uh, a, a large proportion, the majority of our enrollment fees are passed on directly to the instructors. Um, our courses, our programming, we 
uh, we, we try to make sure that it's accessible to everyone. So even if the topic seems to be arcane or seems to be sort of a less accessible topic, the way that we design it is we try to make it so that anybody can walk in without preconditions, without prior qualifications, and engage with the topic and engage with the lecturer directly. Before I leave the stage to these highly qualified people is to urge you to participate in our uh, events and in our programming. The best way to do that is to subscribe to the e-newsletter that we have. So there's a, there's a sign-in sheet right there. Uh, so if you haven't done so yet, you're very welcome to sign in. Uh, sign up for our uh, for our for our e-newsletter, so you'll get monthly updates about uh, what kind of programming we're putting on, and also you can become a member of PICT because we rely on membership donations in order to make events like this happen. So you can click membership on the website, and you can become a member and decide on the size of your own contribution. So you can decide how much you would like to contribute to PICT. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much, and I will leave the stage to Jonathan Ray and his interlocutors. Thank you. <laughs> well, I would also like to welcome Jonathan and say a little couple of words about him. Uh, he doesn't like being officially introduced, so I will keep it really <laughs> short. Um, Jonathan Ray uh, used to be professor of philosophy in Middlesex, but then as it's become so one of the main frames for which he has become famous, he resigned to have more time to think. <laughs> um, ever since he has become a freelance thinker, a freelance historian and a philosopher, and obviously a writer. And we are here tonight to celebrate his latest, or his second to latest book, Witcraft. Um, the proceedings of tonight will be that you will, Jonathan will, so first say five to ten minutes about the book and then we will have some more general questions to to in investigate a little bit more the topics that are professed in it and then if there are questions from the audience then the audience could ask questions as well so Jonathan five words then and it's free. thank you very much and I I think that actually the book does run in very much the same polemical direction as picked does in one way, the book is a collection of anecdotes about thousands of ordinary people who have somehow engaged with philosophy. And, and it's, some reviewers have said it's just so much fun because it's, it's story after story. And other people have said it's such a bore because it's story after story. But one thing is, it is definitely story. So, for example, um, there's a story about um, a group of uh, Algonquin Native Americans in the 1630s who received instruction in Christianity from an English priest and he he did it both in Algonquin and in English and he reported that they kept asking amazing philosophical questions for example well, a prince of the tribe said well you tell us that it's the body that causes us to sin so why should the soul be punished um, which is rather and then they had a whole series of questions like this and he's and he's and he's well <coughs> he said his congregations in england had never been able to ask such probing philosophical questions about christian doctrine as these as far as he could see you know primitive wild indians managed to do and actually that i think it's a theme that i and I don't really say much about it in the book, but my book's sort of moving in that direction. The idea of w wild philosophy, um, which would be when people just start thinking about philosophy. They may never even have heard of the word philosophy. They haven't read a philosophy book. But they just go out and look at the night sky. It's a very common, universal philosophical experience. And just think, you know, from the point of view of the cosmos, this human adventure is just so absurd. Um, or, you know, someone dies and you think, well, what happens to my love for them? Or all sorts of thoughts like that that you don't have to have any uh, philosophical background to consider. Or there's a story of a nice story about a, a woman called Mary Astle, who's a working class woman who wanted to be a poet in north of England. And she heard, this was um, the end of the 17th century, she'd heard about this... French philosopher, not she, she knew what his name was, but he'd said something about seeing all things in God. 
the Malbranche, obviously, and Malbranche was translated, and there were lots of enthusiasts for Malbranche in, in England. Anyway, she wrote to someone who was known to be a Malbranche specialist, and she said, I have this great movement of love in my soul, and the thing is that it is a movement of love towards a woman, and I want to know whether Pam Malbranche would have anything to say about that. And the person she wrote to, who was actually a terrible reactionary old Tory, but he nevertheless wrote back and said, yeah, of course, wh what Malbranche teaches us is that God is love and that every exercise of love is an aspect of God. And she was emboldened by this. She later went, up to, went on to become, well, some people say the first English feminist. She talk, talked about setting up women's colleges. And she had this doctrine that sort of came from what she heard about from Malbranche, that actually, you sh in some ways, it's if you want to be philosophically wise, it's better not to be educated. And she did actually get this theme from a bit of Malbranche where he talks about children and women who have no anxiety about academic recognition, often have more insight into philosophical problems than people who've read the whole of Aristotle. And there are lots more stories. There are stories about William Hazlitt and George Eliot and a wonderful Scottish Highlander called Thomas Davidson who then goes off to America, um, starts an Aristotle club, which he's one of the waiters in his restaurant comes to it. And, and that waiter is, um, what's his name? I can't remember his first name. Um, Pulitzer, anyway. And he becomes a, a, a newspaper magnet and funds this guy, Davidson, to set up philosophy camps just outside New York where he took young Jewish immigrant boys out to the countryside and taught them philosophy, and a whole set of events. Anyway, there's so much stuff going on in philosophy's past, and I, so part of my, the aim of the book was to just revive, you know, find out about this and tell the anecdote. So it's, as I said, some people think that's boring, some people think it's fun, but the other aspect of the book is that in some ways it's quite an angry book. It's a polemical book. It's a, it's a, because it's, it's partly just saying, actually philosophy, in the past has involved all sorts of people whose names don't get into philosophy books and indeed whose sense of what philosophy is for isn't about producing huge abstract systems or solutions to abstract metaphysical problems. It's to do with working out their own b problems in thinking about their own experience and um, and, it, it's, and it does seem to me that in the last hundred years especially that sense of philosophy has been taken away from us. And part of the polemical purpose of this book is to say that these books, which we have, have sort of dominated philosophy for the last 200 years called The History of Philosophy or The History of Western Philosophy, have actually done an enormous amount of damage. We usually think of those books, I mean, they're not very prestigious. You know, you, the, the big names of philosophy don't... Uh, refer to them and if they write them they do it I mean as Bertrand Russell famously did he did it towards the end of his life and because he wanted to make an awful lot of money which he succeeded in doing he didn't regard it as a serious piece of philosophical or historical uh, work but it was a huge money spinner and so people think of well who cares about histories of philosophy but my sense is that actually the, the public the general public and indeed the philosophy profession, their sense of what philosophy is is much more defined by these histories of philosophy. Because they all say the same thing. They say, oh, well, you know, philosophy exists today as a great academic discipline, but it goes back through, well, you know, the modern phase began with Descartes and Enlightenment, and then before that there was the Middle Ages, which was a bit dark, and then there were the Greek and the Romans, and so there's this continuous tradition. And that's a story that nobody started telling until the 18th century, and it's become so dominant it's become, I would say, f histories of philosophy are, they, they have an ideological function in telling philosophers how important they are, telling them what their, you know, what their history is. I mean, it's rather like histories of England, that, you know, ending up with Brexit. Um, and, <laughs> and histories of philosophy ending up with whoever you think is the important figure in contemporary um, philosophy. They, and they tell us what sort of issues philosophical issues philosophers discuss, what sort of people philosophers are. Um, and it seems to me that they have massively damaged 
philosophy because I, I, what's philosophy for? I would say philosophy is essentially an incitement to intellectual disobedience. And if you read the histories of philosophy, you won't get that impression at all. You'll just get the impression, you know, Descartes was born in 1596 and he was the great rationalist philosopher. And you think, well, that's not, he wasn't born as the great, you know. He went through all sorts of interesting intellectual struggles on his way. And, and in fact, you know, I, you could say that my book is about a lot of ordinary people and their engagement with philosophy, but it does mention a lot of the big names as well. But it, what it tries to do is to suggest that they're ordinary people struggling with their own problems as well, which is not the impression you'd get by reading any of these books called The History of Philosophy or The History of Western Philosophy. So it's, it, it's a polemical book as well as an anecdotal one. Okay, thank you. I'll immediately come back to some of the things you, you said with the first question, and it regards what, what can be seen, I think, the, n the quest for non-purity of philosophy that's present in <coughs> your book. It, the subtitle of the book is The Invention of Philosophy in English. But one of the main things I think that is so important is that there are so many non-English philosophers there. If one would generally read, like you already mentioned, if one would generally read a history of English philosophy, there would be no continental or hardly any American <coughs> thinker in those books, whereas here, even though it regards, or its main topic is the invention of philosophy in English, there are a lot of uh, uh, European, a lot of Americans, um, philosophers present there who have obviously helped to create philosophy in, in the English uh, world. At the same time, another aspect of the impurity, like you already mentioned, is the so many non-philosophers who have been so important for the the, the whole history of philosophy. The, uh, your first philosopher you mention is Hamlet. So he's not, <laughs> he's not really the first name mentioned in the book is Hamlet. So you don't even have a real person <laughs> there. And he's considered as the first philosopher. So I think I, I would ask you, could you say something more about this quest for non-purity? You already said a little bit, but maybe insist on in that a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so, well, uh, in particularly in relation to English. I mean, one of the streams ages ago that went into the conception of this book was that I was, I thought that, well, I was involved in an aspect of, of British philosophy in the 70s and 80s, which was very keen on introducing, I don't know, Sartre, Althusser, Derrida, Heidegger into English speaking philosophy. And a lot of my colleagues and friends. Uh, well, I. A rather unthinking contempt for all philosophy in English. And as it happened, I had spent quite a lot of time reading, I don't know, Locke and Hume, and I thought they were actually extraordinarily interesting. And I remember some colleague of mine, terrible bloke, who was a, a big professor of continental philosophy, and I said I was thinking of writing something about philosophy in the English language. And he said, well, that shouldn't take you long. <laughs> the, the idea being that really, you know, Englishness and philosophy just don't mix. Um, it's like Englishness and fine cookery don't mix. Um, um, anyway, that was that was the the prejudice. But in a way, that got lost in the in the writing of the book. The the other thing that's important to this idea of talking about the invention of philosophy in English is that the history of philosophy is to a, a remarkable extent a history of translation or a history of negotiations between languages. I mean, if you take the account of how philosophy developed that you get in the standard histories of philosophy that I was talking about, you know, you could say, well, the Greeks start off being very worried about their relationship to Egyptian wisdom, the relationship between the Greek language and Egyptian. And then the Romans get worried about, you know, they try and translate Greek philosophy into um, into Latin, thank you. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and sometimes they just transliterate the Greek words and sometimes they try and invent. And, and then, well, in the, I don't know, the 15th century, people start using vernaculars a bit. And that, but there is a huge problem about how to, um, whether to start again, whether to, whether to or whether to just translate or transliterate the Latin in which philosophy had been written for the previous thousand words into, well, it wasn't so difficult if you were translating into French or 
um, Italian. But if you're translating into German or English, it did come out very, very strange. So one theme I wanted to bring out was that f philosophy is, by its nature, a very multilingual activity. If you look at any philosopher's bookshelf, it will contain books, well, probably, you know, if they're very clever, books in several languages. If not, then books translated from several languages. And I think in that respect, it's a, it's a rather unique discipline, that it is a multicultural, multilinguistic discipline. And it seems to me that one of the effects of the histories of philosophy that just try to tell you the story from the pre-Socratics to the present throughout Europe, or perhaps even add in a little bit about Eastern philosophy so that it doesn't sound so quite so imperialist as, as, it, as, as it might, is, is that they, they manage not to notice the issue of translation. It's just that somehow, you know, Descartes had, you know, started this quest for certainty and it somehow was picked up in England and France and you think, how? Um, well, I mean, partly it was because of the spread of Latin, but there was also in the 17th and 18th century a considerable interest in various countries in trying to produce a vernacular philosophical tradition, which meant particularly translating philosophical Latin into modern languages. And I, mean, I suppose if I, if I spoke all the European languages, and if I had a hundred years at my disposal, then I might have tried to write a book that would be about the translation of Italian into French and English into uh, German and vice versa. But anyway, I just it made more sense just to focus on English, and and so the book is about philosophy in English, but it's about how Plato and Aristotle get translated into English, how Descartes appears in English. And there is a particular issue that confronted people in the, well, beginning in the 16th century about putting philosophy into English, which is the question of Latin, the relationship between Latinate words and the English language. And there was this interesting character called Rafe Lever, who wrote, he said, people are starting to write books about philosophy in English. But it seems to me that they're not really written in English at all. They're not written in proper English. So you will find them talking about how, for example, every proposition is either an affirmation or a negation. Well, that just means that every propositio is either an affirmatio or a, whatever it was, a negatio. And he had this uh, wonderful idea. Well, he said, no, we shouldn't say that. What we should say is every show say is either a yay say or a nay say. Every proposition is either a yes saying or a no saying. Then we would start being able to philosophize in English. And it, it is actually quite an interesting uh, speculation to think whether philosophy would have found itself m more at home in English speaking cultures if Rafe Lever had been successful and people had started writing philosophy in a way that in a way that doesn't sound so Latinate, because it's still the case. You know, George, 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 George Orwell made a great play of how terrible it is when people start using Latinate words instead of proper English ones. And, and Johnson's Dictionary is about finding the pure sources of genuine English. And, and there is this sense that you know, if you want to talk proper British English, then you should avoid Latin words. But if you want to talk philosophy in English, then you can't. So, and, oh, and by the way, the title which Rafe Lever gave to his book on, the, on putting philosophy into proper English was Whitcraft, because he thought it, 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 was his, it was his suggestion for a genuinely English word that would translate the word logic. Um, because he said, you can, you can call it logic, but logic, what, what does any English, you know, true born Englishman or English woman understand by the word logic. It's just, you know, it's just a transliteration of a Latin word logicae, which is just a trans transliteration of a Greek word. And why the hell, if we're going to speak English, can't we at least do it in English? Um, so 
I'm not sure if I, I've answered Christoph's comment about purity. I've taken it as a question of linguistic purity, where the, well, I think that anyone who wants to celebrate uh, philosophical culture must also be a fan of linguistic hybridity and miscegenation. There's no such thing as philosophy and a pure language. So in fact, it's precisely when you realize a lot of philosophy actually comes from recognizing that when you try and put that words in different languages sort of interfere with each other. And that sort of makes you think that once you... Because, I mean, so much of the experience of philosophy is about... Sorry, I'm rather monopolising this, but um, uh, uh, one, of, one of the things that struck me once I'd finished the book, and I was actually reading the proofs, and I said, God, you've written so much about people's relationships with their parents. Um, and then... I, and it occurred to me that actually that wasn't an accident at all, because one of the sources of philosophy, I think, is people, you know, at a certain age, beginning to think that the language that they've been to, everything that they've learned to take for granted, isn't necessarily so. And that, and that, and you get, you know, the words you used may not actually be very good words, or in particular, the things that your dad has told you to believe may not be true and that um, uh, and I it, actually I've, I think I've lost the thread of my thought now but um, um, but the, anyway so that's where you know, I, I said something earlier about um, philosophy of being about disobedience I think it's particular it's 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 about disobedience to intellectual father figures um, and that's something that I hope has comes across in the book. It's one of those, and it was so interesting to, to me to find that I'd written a book about revolting against intellectual father figures without realizing it. So I will follow actually uh, Christoph's uh, question and then ask you as well uh, about the purity. Like it seems that you're broadening not only the meaning of doing philosophy, but broadening the meaning of a philosopher from Hamlet to astronomers to mathematicians. In your account, it seems that even someone without a text to their name, like an inspirational teacher, can play an important role in the chain of philosophical tradition. It seems that you view philosophy as a practice that anyone can engage in rather than a title or a professional job description. Mm. And you present a history of philosophy that also shows us this invisible link in the transmission uh, chain of philosophy. So who, in your opinion, is a philosopher? I think it's anyone who just stops and thinks. Um, and, and anyone who just interrupts a process of thinking that is sort of seems to be flowing very naturally for them um, and starts thinking, well, it's not obvious that that is the right way to think. Um, so I think it's, there is this sort of double movement. You have to have somehow absorbed, I don't know, just a, absorbed a whole set of, well, this is everybody's you know, experience of human culture, that as a child, you absorb all sorts of things. In particular, you absorb, you absorb the language of the people around you without being aware that it's one language and that there are other languages. And, and you absorb their words and you absorb their accents and you observe, absorb all their habits and that at some stage... Um, you start wondering whether that was the right thing to do. And I suppose if I had to sort of offer you a, a definition of the philosophical impulse, I would say that it, it's that. It's when you start thinking, that's what I was brought up to believe, but maybe I shouldn't carry on believing it. So can I continue asking another mm. question concerning it? So, so you mentioned many history of philosophy texts uh, that seek to systematize and essentialize philosophy, trying to determine the truth and falsehood and to close a subject of inquiry. Uh, in contrast, it seems like your understanding of history of philosophy lays emphasis on interpretation, the infinite openness of the subject in question, leaving room for contingency, the personal, the seemingly random, like you picking up the Sartre book as a young teenager. Why should we look at the philosophy, history of philosophy, your way? I think because it makes it more interesting. I mean, I d I, there is something terribly depressing about... I mean, I don't know if you've 
if any of you have read any of these books called the history of philosophy, you know, from the beginning to the present, um, you come away thinking, well, you know, all these clever people have devoted their lives to trying to sort out these questions and they don't seem to have come to any agreement about any of it. So what the hell am I supposed to do in this context? There's no point. And actually, I think that there's a... Yes, one of the effects of... Yeah, one of the features of histories of, of philosophy is that they do produce very schematic, simplified um, versions of, of events so that you do end up sort of... and. And it's very interesting that a lot of people who, you know, if they're told, oh, you should go and read some Kierkegaard, they will say, oh, well, perhaps I'll go and look up Kierkegaard in a history of philosophy. And so they'll get down Bertrand Russell's history of philosophy and find that actually Kierkegaard is not mentioned at all in that particular book. But you can go to, go to others and you will find out that Kierkegaard was this irrationalist um, reacting against Hegel. And then you will say, oh, well, I've got the general idea and Hegel was reacting against Kant. And you get this sort of, you get this roadmap in your head, so it's showing how things happened and how this had to happen. And Locke was against Descartes, and therefore he was an empiricist and not a rationalist. And so, then you find, if you did then actually read Locke and find that he says that uh, the propositions of morality can be proved with mathematical certainty. You'll think, oh, no, he can't possibly have said that because the history of philosophy book has just told me that he's against all this rationalism business. And somehow it, those, those simplifications um, really t take hold. And um, sorry, what was your question again? I think you're answering it, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, You're telling us the former way of doing it, like like systematized essentially oh, oh yes, philosophy, yes. and um, why shouldn't we do following that rule? Of history? Yeah, and and I think that yes, and, and the the true story, you know, if you get closer, even to the, you know, even to the great classics, you'll find that they are also much more full of contradictions and doubts and developments over time, which are all sort of edited out in order to make a simple story for the for your history of philosophy lectures, or indeed your history of philosophy exams. Um, and so, I mean, I think I already said this, I, I, I like the idea of putting philosophy back in the hands of ordinary people, but also of reminding ourselves that the great dead philosophers were themselves ordinary people who had childhoods and then got discontent with what they'd been told. So that's the same story for, for everybody who gets engaged in, in philosophy. And I do indeed think, you know, as I mentioned, this idea of wild philosophy, that there are, that, that there are ways in which people can engage in what is quite properly called philosophical activity, philosophical thinking, even if they've never heard the word philosophy and never read a philosophy book. Um, because it, if you just define it as, sensing that there's something not quite right in the in your own ideas and trying to sort it out or trying to get some perspective on it. There's an awful lot of critique of the university as an institution in the book. It starts I'm afraid so. <laughs> <laughs> it starts in the beginning with against the Latin translations of Aristotle who mm. come to England and it ends with Wittgenstein not being happy in Cambridge about mm. the whole institutional conflict. It seems that philosophy, how you intend it, is somehow, is somehow requires or is essentially against the institution as if it, it tries to tame the philosopher and the thinking that goes along in there. I think it's a terribly difficult task to be a teacher of philosophy. Because if I'm right that you know, philosophy is, a, um, is an incitement to intellectual disobedience, then you know, the professor walks into the room and say, be disobedient. <laughs> and, you know, you have, it, it's, um, and, I, 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 you know, teachers from, 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 I mean, I think Socrates is supposed to do it and Kierkegaard and Wittgenstein certainly did, that you want, if you, to be a great teacher is to take no, it's, it's not to want to have followers. Yeah, that's, that's right. A great teacher is someone who has no disciples. Because if you have disciples, then you've somehow betrayed your task as a teacher, which was to give people some sort of autonomy. 
Um, and I mean, I, I spent an awful lot of my working life as a paid philosophy teacher, and I, I don't think it was a disaster, and I think some of my colleagues did a really good job of it. But there's also, I, th I think it is, it's, it is essentially a, a very, very tricky task, and that in a way, the clearer and more helpful the teacher is to their students, the more they betray the students. <laughs> that actually, um, that, that, you know, if, if you do this business of saying, oh, well, this is all terribly complicated, but I think I can explain it, and then at the end of the lecture they think, oh, that's, I thought I'd never understand Kant, but now I've got it, um, then that's actually a bit of a disaster. Can I, I remember this thing I was going to say a minute ago, which is about the idea of popularization, because histories of philosophy do have a cultural function. You know, certainly Bertrand Russell's, and most of them, they're supposed to be presenting this you know, perhaps rather arcane, incredibly difficult discipline for the benefit of a general public. The basic market for histories of philosophy is young people who get given them as presents for, you know, by uncles saying, oh, well, this is a very clever kid and maybe we should give him a book on the history of philosophy, not that I'd ever read it myself. Um, and so, and they are, so they are works of popularization and something that's really... Well, I think there's a very important paradox about the project of popularization, and actually, I this this came to me because I I've, I've been going through a lot of family papers, and I came across a letter that my mother's mother wrote to my mother about how she'd been reading Bertrand Russell. Not, I think, the history of Western philosophy. So this was in about 1950. Um, and she said, isn't it so wonderful that a man of such extraordinary genius takes the trouble to try to explain things? And he does it so clearly. But I'm afraid in the end I don't really understand. But it does make me admire his genius. And, and I, I thought, well, actually, the project of, if I say, look, you know, Kant's really difficult, but... Um, as a very rough simplification, I can tell you this, that, and the other, and then you will go. And actually, the effect of that is not to liberate you and make you feel that you've mastered Kant. It's to make you feel that I've mastered Kant and you're never going to. So that I think the project of popularization is inherently very, very, um, very dodgy. That actually, it makes it makes you it makes it seem as though the topic being popularized is one that ordinary people would never really be able to understand. And that's why they have to make do with a, um, an abbreviated, you know, a, a something made simple kind of, kind of version. So that what appears to be a very democratic gesture of making these difficult topics available to a general public may implicitly have exactly the opposite meaning which is that it makes people think these things are much too hard for me. And I remember seeing colleagues of mine doing this all the time. They'd say, uh, uh, saying, well, of course, this is it's very difficult to explain in, in brief, but just as a very rough approximation, you could say that what Kant did was this. And I knew when I heard them say that, the rough approximation was all that they had in their heads. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you see what I mean? They were making, they were pretending to have some huge knowledge, which they are being kind enough to produce a little sort of sample of for the benefit of the children. And in fact, they don't know any more than they do, but it's a kind of, so that the, the act of popularization is actually a way of elevating the popularizer into being a genius who is c being good enough to expound his ideas to the general public. So I can actually take from there, <laughs> and then, because often philosophy is regarding as something otherworldly and philosophers as quasi-aliens with little connection to our impact on the world. Your book paints a different picture showing the intricate interrelation between philosophers, philosophies, and the worlds that encompass them. 
And what kind of message would you like a philosopher reading your book to take away from it, especially regarding the responsibility associated with doing philosophy? Hmm. Well, <laughs> I I think one thing would would be I I find it very strange when people even when someone describes themselves as a philosopher that always sounds to me a bit sort of pretentious because it's because philosopher is a sort of you know it's a sort of ideal um, it's like saying I'm a, I'm a very wise person <laughs> <laughs> and it's um, and then well I. Th I mean, I think there's such a thing as a teacher of philosophy, whether, and I'm happy to use, I mean, that seems a relatively neutral word, but the word philosophy does seem to me to be capable of doing a great deal of mischief. Um, but if it is not going to do mischief, then I think it needs to keep coming back to the idea that um, you don't go to philosophy in order to learn some body of wisdom that you then imbibe and sort of digest and incorporate into your own body of thought, you do it in order to encourage you to think for yourself and, you know, um, you have the right to revolt. That should be the message that the philosopher... Oh, you're oh. Okay, oh. so my last question. <coughs> Uh, as you were writing the book, was there something that made you drastically reevaluate your approach to the history of philosophy? Was there some way in which you'd understand the history of philosophy, for instance, developing um, a certain thinker or a concept that drastically changed thanks to your research for this book? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, there were people about whom I knew nothing before I started writing the book. No, I mean. There's a, there's a lot of stuff about William Hazlitt, you know, famous as an essayist and Shakespeare critic, but also who had a childhood infatuation with philosophy. George Eliot, obviously famous as a novelist, but also had a, an early, very close engagement with philosophy and with translating German and Latin philosophy into English. Um, so in a way, that was those were sort of revelations that I... I didn't know, but, but perhaps I should say something about the way I okay, uh, the way I wrote the book. When I started, well, uh, uh, when I started, when I realised that I needed to start this book, I was going to write this book, and I needed to start it in the <coughs> round about sixteen hundred. Um, I made a decision that I would tell the story in episodes. So I would go, so there's a chapter on 1601 and then there's a chapter on 1650. So it's, there are sort of time slices at 50 years intervals going up to 1951, which was partly in order to discipline myself and prevent me from trying to draw lines of connection between epochs. I just wanted to say this is what it felt like doing philosophy at this date. And so my method was to sort of read everything that was published at that date that talked about philosophy and um, and sort of not allow any of my prejudices to colour it. And it's, I, I did at one point say that I thought that this was a bit like um, um, atonal musical composition of uh, using all 12 notes um, so as not to be able to fall into any habitual key, r r r m musical keys, and that I was sort of doing the same by not allowing myself to have, um, to, uh, by not, not allowing myself to fall into tr traditional conceptions of how philosophy developed. And I also disciplined myself that I would not think about what the next chapter was going to be until I had completely finished drafting so when I, um, people s have said, well, you end with a whole lot of stuff about Wittgenstein, and presumably you were always intending to do that. And I had absolutely no idea. I did, because I finished the chapter on 1901. Well, the chapter on 1901, I thought, well, I couldn't, I wasn't sure. I thought maybe I could do something about Bertrand Russell in 1901. 
But then I found Bertrand Russell so unrewarding to read. And then I discovered that William James gave his uh, lectures on varieties of religious experience in that year. So that became the topic for that. I didn't know when I was writing about 1851. And I, was, and I did vaguely think, because I'm very keen on Hannah Arendt, that I might make the 1951 chapter focus on the origin, origins of totalitarianism. And then I, again, f I found, I mean, I do admire her, but it's something that didn't quite resonate enough. And then I, f so then I focused on, on Wittgenstein and said, but I never knew that I was going to do that. I mean, maybe deep down in my unconscious, it's true that, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I became extremely, I sort of fell in love with Wittgenstein and I hadn't, I'd rather forgotten about that. And it did come back to me as I was writing the final chapter, but I never knew what the, what the next chapter was going to be until I started writing it. You just said that you had your chapters every 50 years. You start in 1601, and then you go in 51 and on and on. But you stop at 1951, year 2020. Why didn't you go to 2001? Um, I did wonder about that, and I was in negotiations with a publisher who I eventually didn't who said you have to have a chapter on 2001. Um, well, partly, the book is so bloody heavy anyway. <laughs> um, partly, you know, I'm getting old and I thought I need to finish this book. <laughs> um, because, and um, I, there wasn't any, I mean, there's no reason deep in the structure of the thinking of the book, why it shouldn't have had a 2001 chapter. I'm really not sure that I, well, I just thought I have to stop somewhere. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we can use that as an idea to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody has any questions to Jonathan, please. That's true. Uh, yeah. Schoolmaster's War coming out with Yale. Yeah. So, first of all, would you come back and do a launch of that? I'd love to, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what was it you said about parents and disobedience and philosophy at the very beginning? Um, and I think I came back to it. And I, I, that, that I was surprised when I, when I read back through the book, I realized how many of the people I was writing about had had really difficult relationships with their fathers. They'd loved them and then they'd thought, but my father's wrong about this. Um, and, and then, it's, it, and, and then I, I realized that actually there was a connection between what I think of as valuable in philosophy and, this pr and people having a problem with their f fathers or, or father figures, namely that you know, philosophy is when you start thinking that the thinkers you've regarded as authoritative may not be right. And uh, was your father, a, for you, was your father a philosopher? No. Now, my disobedience, I mean, I guess my, my Oedipal disobedience may have been that I became a philosopher, which he wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't at all. Um, but he, wa he, but he, he did run a réseau of the resistance in the in Franche-Comté in 1943, so that's what this book is about. Um. Anybody else? Yeah, this is all very interesting, but I wonder if you couldn't really cut to the chase. And Haven't I done that already? <laughs> ah. <laughs> I mean, I want to read your yeah. book because you said it's about people's stories. I hope it's people telling their stories, not you telling their stories. Could you I, mm. could you tell us your story? Maybe that's why Probably not. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's <laughs> that's also <laughs> true. That's a, um, well, in a way, yes, I, I I can. I I never I never intended to become a professional philosopher, but I did. Well, if this is any. Uh, I was a student at the University of Sussex, which was a brand new university at the time, and it was and it prided itself on not allowing students to specialise in any one discipline. Um, 
I did philosophy, but I also had to do literature, history, um, um, history of science, um, and and so I and I now realise that. Um, well, that was quite important to me. And then I went to be a graduate student at Oxford, and I absolutely hated it. Um, I hated it because it's such a precious place, because people were so keen on what it meant to be a philosopher and whether you were a good philosopher or a bad philosopher or a mediocre philosopher. And, I, and there was this huge sort of competition to be Strawson's favourite or whatever. And, um, and, it, and it seemed to me... There was something deeply wrong with that. Did you study with him? I didn't, not really, no, I didn't. Um, I, I, my relationship to Oxford was a bit um, distant, really. I mean, I lived there. And I went to some <laughs> lectures, uh, some of which were very good, but I, but I did become, I became incensed about f philosophy at Oxford and Oxford as a whole, and sort of began to see it all as a huge political conspiracy which I hope was going to come crashing down along with imperialism and capitalism, which didn't occur. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I did then get involved with, I think, you know, sort of in, a, in starting a, a magazine, which started in I think, 1972, called Radical Philosophy, which had it sort of talked, it had, it had issues called things like philosophy from below, and it was about, you know, have students have a right to think even if the professors try to stop them, and and I suppose that was very important to me. And then I, I, I mean, I, and I ended up with a teaching job, not at a university, but at a polytechnic, which was had, there was a lot of stuff about polytechnics at the time that they were the people's universities. They they were they were not part of the sort of snobbish system of. English universities, and they really did take, um, most of the students were people whose parents had had very little education, and the students themselves had had a bad relationship with the educational system. Many of them were in their 30s or 40s or even 50s, and they decided late in life to get themselves an education. And I was, and I thought this was, I thought that the polytechnics were a fantastic institution which were going to change the world. I mean, just as my outlook had been changed by the curriculum at Sussex University that we could redesign a curriculum at this university and produce a new kind of um, citizen of a more democratic world. That what didn't work out great either. But <laughs> <laughs> What about before Sussex? The life before Sussex? In what, what made me um, I think I have. I wasn't a particularly happy child, and I would say that I have so I've done so much work repressing the experiences of my childhood that I can't really retrieve them. Um, it would take a long course of analysis for me even to be able to reconstruct a story of what happened to me as a child. <laughs> Thanks for your interest. <laughs> Oh, yes, David. David. So, um, you were saying that um, um, taking a philosophy course where sort of like the major thinkers are summarized or reading a little history of philosophy, uh, which does the same thing, doesn't really bring us to uh, the core of what philosophy is supposed to be or what philosophy is supposed to mean in a person's life. So if we're not going to get that from the summary of a, of, a, of a work or of a thinker in a sort of condensed way, telling us sort of in bullet mm. points the, the, the main conclusions, maybe, at which we're putting our lives, how is reading the source itself, how is reading the book itself going to bring us closer to what, what, what philosophy well, is supposed to be? it's amazing what... I mean, books work in unpredictable ways, and you know, very bad books can provoke very good thoughts in people. And misunderstanding a book can also be—I uh, mean, you could. Uh, um, 
Berkeley misunderstood Locke, and he created this wonderful <laughs> story out of his misunderstanding of what Locke meant by ideas. Um, so there are lots of ways in which um, books can, you know, books that might tend to do, well, books can have, have very diverse effects, and a book which deadens the mind of one person might um, cause a revolution in the mind of someone else. It's very, and I think that's it's one of the reasons why being a philosophy teacher is such a, a difficult thing, that there's no general formula, and I, and that if, as I think, the purpose of the exercise is to get individuals to think for themselves, then there's no one, there's, there's, not a, there's not a recipe you can follow that will get you there. But it's, I mean, it's also the case that the, a very boring course on the history of philosophy, you know, telling you that Descartes was this and Locke was that, you might then go off and read Descartes or Locke and then think, that's not what it, the history of philosophy book said to me. Uh, and actually, to come back to your earlier question, that's, that was one of the things that sort of got me going, that I started, I read, I read, a, I read what, what Descartes was supposed to have thought and how he ushered in modernity. And then I read Descartes and it didn't seem to be the same thing at all. And, I, and everyone was telling me that, that Descartes was this idiot who'd, who thought that the mind and body had nothing to do with each other. And I thought, he can't actually have thought they had nothing to do with each other. And so I, uh, anyway, it's, it's, and I, I, so I think that in some ways, uh, you know, a, a bad teacher can have good effects and a good teacher can have bad effects. And, um, uh, and well, you brought my father into it, um, who was a, a teacher, and he liked to quote something that Bernard Shaw said, which it was that a teacher should always strive to be a warning rather than, a, than an example. <laughs> In other words, the, re you know, the, 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 the students would think, well, I don't know what I want to be in when I grow up, but I certainly don't want to be like that. <laughs> okay. I think we can wrap it up. Uh, do you one, more one more question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I was thinking if I have the courage to be disobedient, <laughs> but I would want to challenge the notion of disobedience, that that's what philosophy is about. Is, is it not about finding out how things are in the end? It seems uh, well, I think, okay, I mean... But is, is it not in the end about, you know, if we do it for a long while, at some point we're going to hear something? I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, philosophy is a word that people try and appropriate to themselves. In, uh, I would say, if you want to define philosophy, then the main task would be to explain what kind of discipline it is that what it is about the discipline that makes it different from, say, the sciences or history. And I think you, I would then say, well, I remind myself that philosophy is just a word that anybody can lay claim to. I would say that, that the thing about philosophy is to think about the, the world as you experience it or the world as it presents itself to human thought, whereas what you were talking about is the project of representing the world as it is. Um, and so I would say that, that I mean, that, that, that philosophy is more about working out how you experience the world, how you think about it, and if you like, the gap between your experience or the interference between what you bring to your experience and what the world brings to it. Mm. So it's, I, I don't think, it, I, it certainly wouldn't be sufficient as a definition of philosophy just to say it's finding out about the world, because then you could say, well, isn't that what geography is? <laughs> I think there's one more question. <laughs> one more question. Um, so I'm interested in this idea of um, amateur, the amateur mm. philosopher, and mm. how far you can get as an amateur. Mm. Um, I'm um, a scientist, and I get people writing to me who are not formally trained, espousing their ideas about something, and often quite intricate ideas which are somehow deeply flawed. I mean, 
interested in God. I'm interested in whether you sympathy. Well, a, do, you, do, do you have a similar experience with people without a formal training who write to you? And and B, I'm interested in, in, in the idea of whether in philosophy it's a bit different. I mean, you, you can maybe get further without a sort of formal toolkit. Because in science mm. you really can't go far. Now, that's a very yes, that's a very intri intriguing question. I mean no, I don't. I mean, now that I've given up teaching, I don't, and I've um, and I don't really make myself available on social, so nobody can get in touch with me. <laughs> that's 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 a deliver and it's very. It is true. I mean, uh, certainly, you know, when I was involved with this magazine, Radical Philosophy, people did sometimes send in things which they said this is extremely important. I have discovered what the secret of socialist revolution really is and you have to publish this 800 page thing because it's because you know the class struggle won't wait um, and uh, um, on the other hand um, you can uh, someone can ask a naive question like my daughter wondering what would have happened if I'd never met her mother. What would have happened to her? And that's a nice, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good philosophical question. You know, what, you know, if, if, you know, if another child had been born, would it be the same as her? Or what, and, and, it, and it does go straight into all sorts of really fascinating, deep issues. So I think actually the genuinely naive and innocent question may well be productive like that daughter's question the trouble is the question that's half that wants to be sophisticated but isn't um, and that that's where the real tragedy is I think yeah. it, it just to this in your own view I have my own view that it's irrelevant now. Is there something like what he calls a toolkit? What would give even the amateur, let's say, the basic tool to ask? Naive, but interesting question, as opposed to fake sophistication and <laughs> a waste of time. <laughs> you know, so um, you see what I mean? You see yeah, what I mean? Uh, Quantum mechanics, you have to know tensors. If you start talking mm. about quantum, and you know, you may find it interesting or not, you may have the time or even the, the brain to do it, but anyone who's in quantum mechanics says, look, dude, yeah. either you get yeah. the equation or we are talking about something else. What would be the equivalent of that in philosophy? From I, don't think I don't think, I don't think there is, I mean, I think you can give people a toolkit, if you like that word, for reading great philosophical books you can give them some idea you know be careful with Kant transcendent doesn't mean the same as transcendental <laughs> that's a useful warning before you start reading Kant and maybe more general um, advice such as don't imagine you know what a book's about until you've got to the end which is particularly true of philosophical books I think that they do tend to have a huge symphonic structure to them but I would say that actually no I think they're very because I mean well like this question of my daughters you know where would I be if you hadn't met my mother um, you don't I mean in a way it's a naive question in a way it's a profound question but what's certain is that she didn't need someone to say it, it was it was spontaneous it was it was wild it just cropped up and I think that probably is a different, I mean, maybe it's, more, it's a bit more like poetry that people can, but not really. <laughs> um, <laughs> not really, because, I mean, people can make some progress with poetry without having read any. But actually, no, I don't want to read a naive poet. I don't mind listening to a naive person thinking about philosophy, though. My question. I was wondering about uh, whether 
your way of differentiating between philosophy and other fields like more scientific fields is this difference is valid for so many fields for instance if you would go to economics well mm. what is hard science in economics what is not so hard mm. you would probably uh, have uh, some sort of uh, happiness that philosophy would be from time to time maybe able mm. to simplify your thinking mm. and maybe you would be in other moments very frustrated <laughs> like uh, like we all are <laughs> so <coughs> I was wondering how you see do you mean h- how philosophy can make a contribution to other disciplines have I yes um, I, mean, I think one of the things that I, I mean people get very worried especially as universities develop about saying well what's the line between sociology and economics and 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 actually I mean I think the nat- natural sciences are much better because they keep naming new disciplines every five years they produce but then the, but in the you say, well this is but that's not history it's philosophy and that's and I think it's it's terribly unhelpful I mean there are various habits of mind that are more clustered around one of those words than another of them and I would well, as, as I've said a hundred times this evening I think what really seems to me to be the core of, of philosophy is a sense of, of not Um, accepting intellectual authority and obviously that can be useful in disciplines other than philosophy but it could also be bloody annoying if you're you know if your physics students say well are you just saying that <laughs> uh, why should I believe you when there is a there is much more scope for the teacher to say sorry but that's just bloody well how it is and you've got to learn it there's much more scope for that I, I would say Philosophy is the discipline in which there is a least scope for that sort of remark. Final question? Is there nobody? Okay, then yeah. I'd like to thank Jonathan. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you. <laughs> It's a lovely read. <laughs>